Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. We are so excited to welcome you um, to Coffee with our Head of School. My name is Dempsey Schott. I am an Assistant Director of Admission here at Walnut Hill School for the Arts, uh, as well as an alum, a uh, member of the class of 2014. Um, I am joined today um, by two students, Mackenzie and Amir, as well as our Head of School, Antonio Viva. Um, thank you three for being here this morning, um, and I'm so excited to turn it over to Mr. Viva. Well, thank you so much, Tempe. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, I want to just welcome everybody uh, this morning. It's wonderful to have all of you here. Uh, I want to take a few moments this morning to talk a little bit about what I think makes Walnut Hill such a special place and I think a really important option for, uh, for students as they consider their high school education and their high school careers. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I hope everyone can see this okay. Um, I, I, Walnut Hill was founded in 1893 by two Wellesley College graduates with the distinct uh, desire and mission to educate young women at the turn of the 19th century. And, uh, and so our mission has, uh, has in many ways remained consistent with trying to educate young people. But one of the things that happened in the mid 70s was that, 70s was that Walnut Hill uh, adopted an arts mission and became an art school. And that is the Walnut Hill that you know of today. And so I have a copy here of our, uh, of our mission statement. And we say that Walnut Hill School for the Arts educates and trains creative and intellectually curious young artists to make an enduring impact in the world. And I think the world we are living in today requires creative, thoughtful, energetic, individuals to go out and find meaningful and important solutions to the many challenges that are facing us in our modern society. Uh, Walnut Hill is also guided by five key core values. We talk about these values as informing our work as a community. So every member of the Walnut Hill community from our board of trustees to our newest ninth grader uh, understands that growth, community, respect, creativity, and excellence are important cornerstones of the work that we use, the words that we use to engage in the work that we do day in and day out. And I believe that one of the things that's really critical for uh, viewers today, for our visitors today to know is that we constantly come back to these values and we ask ourselves, how are we doing and how are we living up to these values? And in what ways are these values being challenged, especially during the time of COVID? And so I just want to share them with you as a point of reference and knowing that we ask all members of our community to understand these are the words that and the ideas that inform and guide our work. Um, I want to share I want to share a little bit of, a, of an idea of where I think we are in the state of education. Education has changed so much in the last eight months. It has gone through a revolutionary upheaval across the country, all types of schools, public schools, private schools and uh, charter and parochial schools have all found themselves asking, what does it look like to educate young people in, in a world where we've moved almost entirely to a remote environment? And so schools have struggled with that. And we've been talking about this for a long time at Walnut Hill. In fact, uh, the author Dan Pink talks about how uh, there's a need for uh, softer skills. In fact, the 18th century was the agricultural age. And, that was when we were training young people to, to work in an agricultural age type environment. Think of farmers and young people working out in the fields. And in the 19th century, we shifted into a society that was preparing for factory workers. That was the industrial age and the skills associated with the industrial age created schools that were there to try to prepare a workforce that was working in factories and as part of the industrial revolution. In the 20th century, we saw the influx of technology come into the way we think about the world we live in, the way we interact with the world. Uh, the internet, mobile technology uh, has become ubiquitous. And so in the 20th century, we were thinking about knowledge workers uh, and looking at the ways in which we could develop skills for that age and for that generation. Um, however, we are now squarely into the 21st century, and this is what Dan Pink calls the conceptual age. These are concept workers, creators, and empathizers. These are skills of high touch, empathy, understanding the subtleties of the human interaction, finding joy in one's purpose. And there's also skills of high concept, 
which involve the capacity to detect patterns and opportunities to combine different and maybe unconnected ideas together. And those are in many ways the skills we are watching unfold right now. Those are the ways in which young people will need to be prepared for a future that has become increasingly more conceptual. And I believe that ultimately that is what education provides. Uh, there was a great piece a few years back about if you want your children to survive the future, you should send them to art school. And uh, what I love about this is that the, the, the question that the author asks is, can you imagine a world in which, in which most jobs are obsolete? Now, what's unfortunate is that we have seen COVID decimate a variety of industries and change the nature of the workforce. And while the arts have been challenged throughout COVID, what I have found both uplifting and deeply powerful and moving is how the arts have not only survived during these last eight months of COVID, but they've begun to adapt and thrive. In fact, humanity and those of us here in the United States in particular have relied on the arts, whether that's spending some time listening to good music, accessing performances and and archival um, performances that would have never been made public before and creating new opportunities for individuals to access the arts through technology has been something we've watched happen. But what I think I share with this with this article are five key areas that I believe an arts education provides as a solid foundation for every young person who has the privilege to get an arts education through high school. Uh, the first is that we talk about investing heavily in time and resources that improves and expands your child's creative literacy. I believe that families and, and parents that do that, they will give their kids the best chance at finding work and fulfillment in a future where other human abilities may become irrelevant. Uh, and if you've watched the advancements of artificial intelligence and quantum computing, you're realizing that we are quickly coming into an age where some of the original skills that we were training kids for are becoming, in fact, obsolete. The second area that we that we talk about here is that an arts education might promise a life of self discovery, but there's always been very reasonably assured financial stability in high demand areas of science, education, skilled trades, government, etc. Um, I don't think we're going to see that dynamic last much longer as more and more physical and mental human tasks are commandeered by machines and software. And so getting back to Dan Pink's point of a conceptual age where we have to prepare students for softer skills, this is something inherently that I believe the arts provide. The third area is that it is inherently human to want uh, the objects in our lives to communicate feelings and ideas to us and about us. And the constant searching for an assignment of meaning dwells in everyone, but the artist is, in, is the person who exercises this muscle regularly enough to control it. And I think we are squarely reminded right now in this current moment in history that artists, artists do provide us the ability to know that human beings are capable of making beautiful things. And that is something I think we can all appreciate in this period of time. The fourth area is that uh, it talks about creative literacy and a basic understanding of the mental, emotional, and sociological tools used for creative thought and communication. Uh, and being able to find purpose and apply meaning to a student's world rather than having uh, meaning handed down and purpose assigned to them is something I think the arts squarely do for all young people. Um, and I think that we exercise this way of thinking throughout every aspect of our program. Our academic faculty look for ways to connect information and ideas, as well as acquiring the skills and processes needed so our students can develop a deeper sense of what they're learning and why they're learning it. And then finally, I think we know that the arts have the capacity to teach resilience, have, uh, they give students an opportunity to learn from mistakes and adapt to an ever-changing landscape. And uh, I think we can all appreciate that we are in the middle of an educational revolution right now that is reflecting a very new reality and it gives students the necessary tools to survive it. The arts are, in fact, the answer to that reality. Um, and we know that technological advancements are always going to outpace the offerings of a traditional classroom and that's going to make things like forced memorization of knowledge irrelevant in the future, um, even before I think this this current group of students graduates. 
And what we need to hone in on are skills that best ensure adaptability and resourcefulness during times of constant and difficult change. And so what I would share with everybody is that we have some proofs of, of, of concept on that. And the way we look at that is not only in the way that our students thrive and grow during their time at Walnut Hill, but we're really proud of the places they go to. And Walnut Hill is a school that focuses on finding the right fit and the right match for each of our young artists. And for some of that, for some of them, it is going on to pursue their art at a very high level. Some of our students will go directly into a professional dance company. Some students will go off to conservatory or art school, but others will take a more traditional route if there is such a thing, uh, attending a high level liberal arts college or university. Um, now, I think what we know is that the steps towards the future involve not only high school and college, but what comes after that. And the World Economic Forum just shared an interesting article recently about what talent means in a post COVID-19 workplace. And the crux of the article talked about how we are seeing a shift in what, what the future may look like and the skills and attributes and qualities companies and employers are going to be looking for. And I think what you can see through this graph is that we are shifting away from a much more traditional and I would argue dated paradigm to one that I think is fundamentally focused on purpose, social responsibility, people, work, and skills, um, and looking forward, as well as having a generational view to what, what the work is that any particular company or organization may be involved in. Um, so getting back to the solution for that, I believe that the solution to that is art school. And I think in this quote, if preparing your kids for a world in which hardworking, knowledgeable people are unemployed, frightened, then the author says he has some good news. There is a solution and it doesn't involve tired, useless attempts at suppressing technology. Like most good solutions, it requires a trait that is distinctly human. And what he's talking about is creativity. Again, one of our key five core values. Um, I will share with you that our alumni are a diverse group of individuals and they come to us from all different parts of the United States and all over the world. And what we found in their journeys after they leave us is they, they, they gravitate towards such a wide variety of, of organizations and companies, some in the arts and the creative fields, others in the fields of science and technology and finance and higher ed and nonprofits. And so we feel really good about the work we've done with our alumni. Uh, and we hear from them about the successes that they've had. And in many ways, they will look back at the foundation they've gotten as a part of their early career start at Walnut Hill. So I will leave you with this thought that we prepare students for a variety of tests here. And those tests may not be as traditional as they are at other schools. We prepare our young artists to enter the world of the arts in a way that provides them a solid foundation. And so we prepare them for these kinds of tests. But I would also argue that our students come to us equipped by having experienced a, a, a rigorous and unique academic program that understands the way they think about the world and that is focused on a student-centered approach to teaching and learning. And so what I would argue is we prepare them for these kinds of tests, which is what does their journey look like after they leave us and what college are they looking to maybe potentially attend. But what I would argue, especially in a world where we are dealing with so many challenges and in a world with a backdrop that has not only a global pandemic, but significant civil and political unrest, as well as a need for us, like many other predominantly white institutions to address forms of systemic racism, I believe the greatest and most important test we can prepare our young artists for is to be citizens of the world. It is without question the single most important test I believe we are here to prepare them for. And so I hope that as you explore Walnut Hill as an opportunity for your student and for your family, you will ask many questions and you will get, engage in a process that I hope provides really meaningful answers to those questions. And so with that, I will end my formal remarks so that we can leave ourselves ample time to be able to answer some questions. Thank you so much for those words, Antonio. You know, I know 
I speak for our whole community when I say we are so lucky and we're so grateful to have you as our leader. And I remain every day so proud to be a graduate of Walnut Hill. Um, so it means a lot to all of us to hear from you and for your time. Um, Mackenzie and Amir, I wanna give you guys a chance to introduce yourselves. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, if you just uh, share with us your name, grade, major, hometown, and any extracurricular involvement um, that you wanna talk about, that would be wonderful. Amir, why don't we start with you? Well, hi, my name is Amir Taylor and I am a senior WFMA, that's writing film and media arts major. And I'm from the Bahamas and um, I'm happy to be here. What about you, McKinsey? Hi, thanks, Amir. I'm McKinsey Wilcox. Um, I am a senior theater major. I grew up in London, but I'm relocated over and now live in America. Um, and I'm ha also happy to be here, excited to be here this morning. So thanks all for coming. All right, thank you both. And I know you have some questions uh, you wanna ask Mr. Viva, so I will turn it over to the both of you, thanks. All right, first question. What drew you to Walnut Hill 10 years ago and what has kept you here over those 10 years? So why don't you speak a little bit about that, your experiences, um, why you came, all of your reasonings actually, just go ahead. Sounds good, Amir. Well, I, um, I, I came to Walnut Hill having been uh, the associate head of school at another independent school, uh, Worcester Academy in Worcester, Massachusetts. And one of the things that I knew I needed to do when I was ready to take the next step in my professional journey was that I wanted to find a way to reconnect to one of my early passions. And as someone who had been an artist and worked as an arts educator, uh, Walnut Hills mission spoke to me at a very deep level, Amir. And I think what has kept me here without question over the last 10 years are the people. Uh, the students at Walnut Hill keep me here and the people, the adults who are make our community keep me here. It is such a unique place. Um, very few places in the world allow young artists or artists at any age to come together and live and work together in the way that we do. And in many ways, that's a really special gift and one that I, I see as a huge privilege. Um, but as I said earlier, I really do believe that, that you and Mackenzie and the other Walnuts that are a part of our school now are the greatest hope we have for the world. Because I believe artists do have the capacity to change the world in meaningful and powerful ways, whether that's through their art or through doing something powerful in, in science or technology or medicine. Um, and so I feel very lucky. I feel like it's a huge responsibility, but I feel fortunate to be a part of a school like this. Um, and I would also say one last thing. Um, we're very different from a lot of other independent schools in that I think we draw upon our shared love and passion for the arts. And that to me brings together such a unique, diverse and inclusive group of people from all different parts of the world and all different walks of life that I really think that um, I wish we could find a way to replicate that for more kids across the country. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, what is campus looking like right now with uh, what are the protocols and what has kind of changed this past uh, year? Well, so Mackenzie, I know you, you and Amir can both appreciate this. I mean, things as students who know Walnut Hill pre-COVID, a lot has changed, right? I mean, we're not able to do some of the things that we've typically done, like bring all 350 of us together in assembly once a week. And so that feels a little different, but we're finding a way to do that virtually, which I think we started last year and at least feels like it's a way for our community to engage. Um, we're all wearing masks. We're all social distancing. Um, everyone on campus is tested once a week. Um, and so we are one of the few schools in the New England area that is testing all of our community members once a week for COVID-19. And I think that's been a way for us to monitor. We've been fortunate over the last three weeks to have no positive cases in our community. Um, the other thing that's different is that um, I think what we realize is that some of what makes Walnut Hill a magical place, which is the ability for our community to experience performances right now is a little challenging. And so we've been able to do some of that virtually, right? We had the collaborative choreography showcase in the fall. We had the night of voice, uh, voice Italian art songs performed in the fall. Um, so I think we're trying to find new and creative ways to come together as a community. Uh, but what I would say to everyone on the call, and I think I've said this to maybe both of you, both Amir and to Mackenzie, 
having students back on campus has made a huge difference. In fact, I saw Amir and about four or five other walnuts up in the back of the Heads house this weekend, hanging out by the hammock, taking photographs. And I have to tell you, for the last seven months without students on campus, it just felt like a very quiet and unhappy place. Uh, so it's just been really great to have students back. All right, well, thank you for that, because I really enjoyed the hammock, actually, and just taking pictures and hanging out in the back there. That's, I guess, the new meetup location. It's a and good it's, spot, isn't it, Amir? <laughs> it is, and the view is awesome as well. It is awesome. All right, so another question, which is, what makes Walnut Hill, a, sorry, what makes a Walnut Hill education different from other independent schools, and where do you see Walnut Hill headed over the next 10 years, but I think I already asked the second question. Separate I mean, yeah, the that's a education good question. Part, yeah. I mean, yeah, so I think, I think the two of you could probably speak to the fact that at Walnut Hill, we're not a high test stakes kind of place. Like we're not a place mm -hmm. where kids have to come together and sit in a gymnasium for midterm exams, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of schools still do that. Um, we're, we're a non-AP school. We, we, we've been a non-AP school for 20 years. And the reason why is because we believe we should define rigor on our terms and not on some outside terms. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we're highly student-centered in that I think students are pushed at their individual level, right? And so some students may advance quicker than others, and we give everybody a chance to grow at the level that we think is right for them. I also think, honestly, when you bring young artists together, you as students create a really powerful culture and, and expectation of high level work. You're serious about your work. You guys do not, as students, take your work and just kind of like, yeah, whatever. Everyone raises the bar for each other at Walnut Hill. And I've seen that for the last 10 years. And whether that's in the theater program or WFMA or music or dance or visual art, I also see it in the academic program where I've been in classes with Mr. Greg and I've watched students just arguing and debating important global topics in his glottomy class as passionately as they are their art. And I think that's what makes Walnut Hill feel and look different. Here at Walnut Hill, the arts aren't an extracurricular activity. Um, and I think both of you can speak to that because you guys probably work harder sometimes trying to get your arts work done than you do maybe in, even in some of your other classes. Um, but what I would say to you is that I think the arts and academics combined here do something pretty special for young people, which is that we don't tell you you have to pick one or the other. We let you explore where your passion takes you. And for some of you that will be becoming an artist but for others of you, it could be doing something totally different. And I think that's what makes a Walnut Hill education unique. I mean, don't you guys, I mean, I'm curious, just let's take a minute, you two experience it. Does that seem fair? Yeah, I want to touch on a point that you made about the individual experience and I guess the choice to um, kind of carve your own path, especially if I go to the academic side of it in humanities, specifically in more like English or English literature or language, whatever you want to call it. Um, mm -hmm. In my old school, it was more of a, you read the novel or the book or whatever passage or piece we're reading. And right. the teachers would give you the information or the facts or this thing represents this, or this is what this means. And they would, they would give you it and you write an essay about it. And everybody's essay is a carbon copy because everybody wants to get it right. But right. here I noticed that, especially me and Mackenzie are in senior seminar, I noticed that we're given pieces and novels and poems to read and you make your own meaning of it. Nobody's telling you what you, what you read or what you think you read, you make your own meaning of it and then you come up with your own piece from it. And that might be a collage essay, a traditional X essay, X, Y essays, um, even poems. So there's definitely an, a, uh, individual route you can go and carve your own way in what you want to do. So I appreciate that. That's a great example, Amir. Thank you, Amir. Yeah, thanks, Amir, for saying that because it is so prominent in senior SEM. Um, we even have like a discussion board um, where students can agree with one another but also disagree. And there's space to like say like, oh, I didn't see this. It's not like we're not, it's not 
devalue, you know, it's just like, oh, I didn't see that. This is what I saw and kind of comparing um, different people's perspectives on different pieces. So I think that's just a huge part and that continues into the art and into um, different, you know, studying different, I do playwriting too. So, you know, we talk about that and, and works in there and there's a nice like connection in academics because you're with all different majors. So um, I think that's where all the different ideas come together and it's, and it's really um, fun, so yeah. That's great, I'm glad to hear that. Yes, and I have a question over um, community and kind of um, how does Walnut Hill engage with the community around us um, and in particular with Natick and how has been engaging with the community been affected because of COVID-19? Yeah, so in the time that I've been here at Walnut Hill, one of the things that we've tried to do is recognize that, you know, our school motto is not for ourselves alone. And we, we say that, and I believe we need to, we try to live that day in and day out and recognizing that while being up here on the hill is a really special experience and it's, and it's unique, we want to be good neighbors and recognize that we're part of a larger community. So with regard to the, just the native community in general, we have done over my time here such a variety of different things, whether that's chamber musicians performing at the local senior center or students volunteering and working with the native organic farm, which comes and taps the campus maple trees for maple syrup in the spring, right? Um, and so we, we think about those kinds of things. We recognize that there's opportunities within the extended communities around us that we have a, we have a relationship with a small early, early Head Start school in Framingham, Massachusetts, uh, where I know Mackenzie, you've actually gone at one point and performed with a, with a group of Walnut Hill students for, for these young kids. Many of them come from low income communities, uh, a low income families. And so I think we're trying to recognize that we want to make the arts accessible and present the arts to a broad range of, of members of our community. But then the other part of, of Walnut Hill that I think is really special is our proximity to Boston. And when we've had the opportunity to engage in the greater Boston area, there's all sorts of ways in which we've been able to either through clubs or service organizations Students have often, you know, I, there've been years where we've organized AIDS walks. There've been times where we've had, uh, you know, students last year went and did the climate strike, I remember in the fall. And so I, I think, well, I don't know if the two of you were involved. Did the two of you go last year to the climate strike? I don't even remember, but a bunch of kids went. So I think, I think ultimately the, the community is a part of our campus and we invite under normal times, members of our community to come for performances every year. We have thousands of people who will come to Walnut Hill for performances, many of which are free. Um, and we also, I think, try to recognize that we need to be a part of the solutions to the community. And so um, whether that is participating in the multicultural fair that happens at the end of the summer, whether that's being a part of Natick Days, which we've done historically, we had several years where students would go down to Natick Days and set up a booth and work with the local police department to paint bike helmets for the local kids who needed a bike helmet. So there's been a variety of activities over the years that have really extended um, the way we reach out to community. And again, it's one of our core values. And so it's not something we do because we feel like it's uh, something that we wanna be able to say we do. We do it because it's something we say we deeply value here. Yes, thank you for that answer. And um, just with the community side of it, under normal circumstances, as Mr. Viva said, there's always opportunities for people to come from the community, outside of the community, from around the United States to come and speak and um, portray or display their talents, I should say, and um, just allow us to be, us as students to be a part of their movement. So that's one of the key aspects of our schools. Another question, one of my favorite questions actually, what opportunities do Walnut Hill students have to explore multiple art forms? And um, how does Walnut Hill encourage students' artistic versatility? So, you know, Amir, you're, you're one of the students who I think could probably speak to this better than any because you are a multifaceted artist. I would say um, over the last two years, we've recognized that students like you and Mackenzie come to Walnut Hill and while you're passionate about your art form, you're really passionate about a lot of things. 
And so we've created a program called Art360 last year, it was the first year we ran it, which was a way for students to explore another art form by taking a class once a week outside their major. And it was a really successful pilot program, one we're going to launch uh, the second half of this year. So R360 will be available for, for current students for the second half of the year. Um, I think the question about artistic versatility is important. And the reason why I think it's important is that when you're at Walnut Hill and you're say a theater major or WFMA major and you go to a visual art show or you see a, a, a music concert, as an artist, that shapes and forms your worldview. You, you cannot attend another art experience and not be shaped by it. And so we know that as young artists, you want to focus on your art at a high level. But I believe actually there's plenty of room for you to explore your skills as beginners in new art forms. Because what we know is that the arts are quickly changing and evolving. And it's not enough just to be an actor or it's not enough just to be a filmmaker. You have to have experience and skills in photography, different types of communication. You might need to collaborate with a choreographer. So having taken a dance or movement class helps build your artistic vocabulary. I think artistic vocabulary is one of the most important things because when you look at the arts, there are specific words and terms and phrases that are used in each art form. And that's a vocabulary that every artist begins to use and utilize. When you start to learn a broader vocabulary, the opportunities for collaboration and creative exploration expand. And I guess what I would say to both of you is knowing you the way I do, you're not solely singular artists in one lens. You have interests in a variety of things. And so we wanna make sure we make room to encourage that. So I'm wondering if the two of you might wanna take a minute and just talk about how you've experienced that um, and, in, and in what ways you think that's important. Yeah, definitely. Um, just being surrounded, like I have, you know, you're friends with everyone in every major and you're interested in what they're doing. So then you're like, oh, well, maybe I'll try it. Kind of like, it's kind of like a, a, like a little thing. You don't really tell anyone. And then it's like, oh, you show your friend who's in VA, you drew something. They're like, that's awesome. You know, it's like a, it's like a, it's a really nice feeling to just start something new and not have you know, it's nice to have a lot of structure in my uh, theater classes, because that's kind of what I'm looking for. But having just like other ways to create art that I just have, they don't have any like rules, they don't get graded, I don't have to worry about like being ready for it for next class. So I think that's just one of the really nice opportunities being surrounded by different artists. And um, even like with the college process, they're asking, what are your other interests? Like, they're looking for artists who, you know, don't just have their interest in the thing they want to do. They want, they want someone who is interested in life, is interested in different, different things that they can bring into their art. So I think that's just something um, that Walnut Hill really supports. And yeah, Amir, what do you think? Well, I personally, this year, I think it started back in sophomore year when in my major we are a versatile major and when it comes to writing writing covers so much things writing covers writing through experience writing covers writing for photography screenwriting playwriting and one of the my favorite classes that we took was songwriting and um mm -hmm. i didn't realize until that sophomore year the ending of that sophomore year that i like songwriting and i like music and writing at the same time and i put it together and that's all in one class. And we got an opportunity to write, to, sorry, to write songs and work with um, Nikki Conrad's, our director of artistic studies. And she has connections with this major producer, one of the best in the world. Um, um, his name is Luis Resto. And we worked with him that year and we made like a, a songwriting showcase with other composers throughout the campus and anyone that wanted to sing or compose our music for us. And fast forward to this year, um, we've done like different coffee houses with him. We've done a whole telethon with him last year. It was my first time doing that. And fast forward to this year, I'm making for my senior project, I'm making a EP, like a short, a few songs that I'm writing originally and he's composing and we're working together. And within like 
the first week of us working together, we have most of the comp composition done for the first song. And I can say now that inviting people from outside of the community, like Mr. Beaver said, now Luis is like one of my musical mentors. Like I've never thought that um, I could just put those two loves together and then this is what comes out of it. So the versatility, now I know that what I wanna hear in music and communicate that to a composer, communicate that to a pianist or a, a guitar player or just anything. And I can have a hand in making the music as well as uh, making the lyrics for it. So that's one of the ways that, one of many ways that when it comes to art in Walnut Hill, you're just not boxed in. So. Yeah, it's a great, those are great examples. Yeah. Um, and I'll just share one last one, which is I had, uh, I had a theater major last year uh, who took my photography art 360 class. And she was just incredible eye, really, really talented photographer. And, you know, I don't think she realized it until she took the class and we started to look at her work and we did critiques and we started to compare. And um, she emailed me over the summer and she's getting into black and white and film photography. And um, it just made me feel really good to know that, you know, students like you said, Amir and Mackenzie do get a chance to explore other parts of themselves, whether it's sharing and drawing with a visual art major or getting to compose original music um, or taking a photography class. That, that is, I think, what makes Walnut Hill special is that it's not just one art form here, right? We're not just a dance school. We're not just a music school. We're not just a theater school or a writing school. We have all five of these art forms here. And even within them, there's so much complexity, right? You have jazz musicians and composers and you have voice majors and you have classical musicians just within the music department. And so Amir is right. The ability to collaborate with all these different artists is really unique. Great. Another question is what have you been doing during, well, quarantine and social distancing? Have you picked up any hobbies? <laughs> um, yeah, I've picked up a couple of hobbies. They're all kitchen related hobbies. Um, so I come from a, a, a family of really fantastic cooks and, uh, and, and my family has been in the restaurant business and worked in food industry for a long time. And so I hadn't really had a chance to, to do a lot of cooking. So I've, I've gotten into being a pretty phenomenal baker and I brew my own kombucha, which I know some people don't like, but I love. Um, but the other thing I have found time to do quite honestly is, um, is to really hone in and build on uh, my meditation practice. And so I spend every day at least uh, 45 minutes or an hour trying to build in some quiet time for, you know, spiritual reflection and meditation, which I think has been a really important way for me to try to stay centered in the middle of everything we've been going through. Um, you know, the last few weeks and months have been very stressful, I think, for everybody, especially with the election. Um, and I think we are now needing time to find a moment of quiet and a chance to even for taking 10 minutes a day. So that's something I've been able to really focus in on, which has been wonderful. And then I'll just say that um, getting a chance to see and spend time with my family has been really important. Um, you know, as head of school, sometimes I'm usually traveling quite a bit or I've got lots of evening and weekend events. And uh, this little bit of a break from that has given me a chance to spend time with my kids and with my wife. And I find that that has been just a really wonderful gift. Um, so those are some of the ways I've spent time uh, during uh, quarantine. I also love going out and riding my bike. And so while the weather is nice, I've been able to do that as well. How about the two of you? What have you two, what hobbies have you picked up during, during quarantine? I personally, going with my senior project, I have just been listening to all types of music. I, I found some classical ones, Luciano Pavarotti. Um, yeah. I found jazz, a lot of jazz influences, R&B, a lot of gospel, because that's my favorite genre. Um, yeah. Even like stuff from musical theater as well, although I don't really listen to it. It's just a bunch of stuff that I've come across. And um, awesome. just that for influence and just to occupy my time and talk with family as well, because that's, I have little siblings, so you need to keep in touch when you're far away. So what about you, Mackenzie? Thank you, Amir. I've definitely been listening to music, getting into 
just like finding little artists. I think like when someone has less than a thousand streams on something, I'm like, well, this is really interesting. Let's see. Like, you know, I think what's really cool about today is you can make something and you don't have to have it produced by a huge company. Like you can just make it yourself. Um, so I've been, I really like finding those little artists. Um, I myself been writing songs too. So Amir, I'd love to connect with you on that. We could chat about that. Um, if you ever want to collab, that'd be really cool. Um, but more like folky music. I kind of like writing that. I learned the guitar. I was really bad at the beginning of quarantine, like three chords. And then I got really kind of got into that, just learning different songs um, and then using those chords from the different songs into like what you write. And so I think just taking inspiration from different artists, I think musically, I think music was the, for me, was the best way to feel connected because it's, I, I, I don't like it to be quiet. I wish I could read, <laughs> like, what, I just, I can't be, I like to hear things constantly. So um, definitely just listening to the stories of music because it's all, it's all storytelling. So it's really interesting to learn about the artist's past and how they bring it into their music, so. Well, I have a recommendation for everybody if they're interested. My favorite album of quarantine has been, um, I, have this, I have this on vinyl, it has been a recording of Aretha Franklin performing live in Paris. So if you don't know that album, everyone on the call, you can get it, you can just listen to it on YouTube for free or Spotify or wherever else. It's best on vinyl, but I know not everyone listens to records anymore, but I recommend it highly. It was one of the records I played maybe at least four or five times a week for about four or five months. It's just so good. Um, and it's a great, great live performance from uh, one of the best musicians who's ever walked the face of the earth, in my opinion. So uh, Aretha Franklin, Live in Paris. It's a great record. Well, thank you. We'll definitely check that out. And um, I think this is, I don't know if this is the last question, but it's certainly one of my favorite questions as well. And I think everybody gets a chance to speak on this one. And that is, what is your fondest Walnut Hill memory? Oh, Amir, there's so many of them. Um, I, think, I think my favorite Walnut Hill moment is Boar's Head. Um, I, the two of you have had a chance to experience Boar's Head for the last couple of years. And it's very different from the time when Dempsey was here. It was still a tradition that we had for a long time, but it's, it's become such a really wonderful holiday kind of pre-winter break um, community experience. And what I love about it is, is that it's kind of goofy. Um, it's not serious at all, which we're so serious about our art all the time. And I love watching visual art majors go, get up on stage and dance or sing um, and watching, you know, dancers trying to do things they're not used to doing. So I just, I love it. It's a wonderfully unique Walnut Hill moment. Um, but I would say if I had to pick a moment of this year, it was when students got back to campus. I mean, that, that has been probably the best experience I've had in the last 12 months. What about you, McKinsey? I would have to say I, I love candlelight. I kind of, um, it's just a really nice, I feel like everyone comes together. Like it's, there's a long break from Boar's Head to candlelight. I feel like there's a long before everyone like, tr like gets together again for an event. So it's nice to come together for candlelight. It's a sad event, but it's very, it's very like, it's emotional, but it's very nice to come together and say goodbye to the seniors and just all, all be together in your grade. And um, yeah, I think that that's one of my favorite memories. What about you, Amir? Well, before I go, can Dempsey, Dempsey, do you have one? Of course. I mean, I have so many. Impossible to, you know, really narrow it down. But I was actually recently thinking about, so um, for those who don't know, I came into Walnut Hill as a new junior um, when I was here, which at many schools, I think would be a, a very frightening experience to come in halfway through high school. And um, one of the things that I really really didn't like about the school I was at before Walnut Hill was that I felt like it was 
very divided in terms of, you know, who you could be friends with, who you could hang out with. I had this, you know, group of other sophomore artistic theater kids who I would hang out with. And there didn't seem to be a lot of like social mobility in terms of talking to the athletes or people who are more interested in math. And um, we all go on this big boat for boat cruise at the very beginning of the year in the Boston Harbor. And as a new junior, you know, I'd only been there for a week or two weeks. And I remember just being on that boat and feeling like, Every single person on the boat was excited to talk to me, to get to know me, and I already felt so embraced by the Walnut Hill community that soon. Um, so although I have many, many more fond memories throughout my time, both as a student and you know now um, as faculty and staff at Walnut Hill, I think that early moment, I just already knew that you know the community was accepting me and there for me, and it felt amazing. So first boat cruise ever. Mine, I'm going to say there was last year when we started Ars360 and um, just the thing about Ars360, Ars360, at least it had its own block in the day. I think it was on Fridays and it was just when it came up and I, um, I signed up to do the hip hop Ars360 with Naomi and the class was very fun, but there was a time when um, I was most excited about it when... Um, pretty big movement came and they they performed an assembly and I didn't know who they were but they were a group of plus size women they were predominantly black but they were multicultural as well I think they had some mixed in there and then they had um I know they had uh, well, Latinx yeah Latinx people they had white women it was plus size women it didn't matter who they were but they came and they performed an assembly. They had a feedback session in, in assembly for us to ask questions, which is another aspect of what we do when we invite different artists to come to the school. And they also had a show, I think that night that they did more of their performances and everybody got a chance to go up on the stage and dance with them, which was really fun. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember that. And then the next day after that, they had a master class or like a, a session or whatever it was the point is it was fun I think it was a master class and I said well I can go to this I'm Caribbean I'm black I have rhythm you know I'm, I'm gonna ace this I'm gonna be the star of the show so I went in there and I thought that I was gonna be able to keep up and was I wrong it <laughs> they I I don't know I I just don't know I'm pretty skinny so I thought I could like move I thought I could <laughs> ace the step it just wasn't working but they didn't care at all. Everybody was having a good time. It was, it didn't matter. There were like 60 or 70 students in there, weren't there, Amir? Say it again. I said there were like 60 students in that master class. It was like packed, wasn't it? It was packed. I think we used Dance Studio 2 and it was packed. Like more people came, um, even people that uh, didn't even sign up. They just let everyone in. And it was such a good time because everybody was dancing. We danced to afro beats we danced to um soca music hip-hop we did a little bit of everything and um to be honest everybody was i think we gathered around in a circle and people could go in the circle and dance and it didn't matter what you did everybody was hyping everybody up like hey let's go and it was just one of the best experiences because the music was great everybody was laughing nobody cared about what anybody was doing everybody was just having a good time regardless of your experience and um, that I wish they can come back again if the time allows or if safety allows. But that was one of the best experiences. And also with the Hip Hop Arts 360, it was a great way to learn about Black culture, especially in music and in dance. We learned about um, Soul Train and Naomi did a good job about educating us with even hip hop, like new edition dances and Soul Train dances and um, whatever dances that were hot in the scene, even from the 80s or the 70s or the 90s. It's just a great way to learn about Black culture. And um, it's just on display all the time. So I really appreciated that about the Hip Hop RC60. And you guys should come and experience it because it's an amazing experience. So, yeah. It was a great experience, Amir. Well, I don't know. Are we, I think we may be at the end of our time. Uh, Dempsey, I'm checking in with you as our admission officer. Uh, so I'm just checking in to find out where we are on time. 
Absolutely. I think it's just about time to wrap things up. I know the three of you have very busy schedules and we want to let everyone who's um, attending this panel get on with their Tuesday. Um, I'm sure you guys have lots to do as well, but I wanted to thank the three of you again for joining us today, this morning. We all really, really appreciate your time and it was so lovely to hear from all three of you about your Walnut Hill experiences. So it's, it's very much appreciated. Um, and to our attendees, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, if you have questions that have been inspired by this or you want to um, chat with other faculty or students, um, please reach out to the admissions office. Our virtual open house is up on the Walnut Hill Arts page. So if you haven't checked that out, there's a lot of great content on there as well. Um, don't be a stranger, get in contact with us. Um, we're so excited that you joined us this morning um, and I hope everyone has a lovely rest of their day. Thank you all again. Bye everyone.